Finally tonight, a special comment about health care reform and tomorrow's summit at Blair House. If I prove to have trouble getting through this, I apologize in advance. Last Friday night, my father asked me to kill him. We were just shy of six months since he was hospitalized, and it was the end of a long day at the end of a longer week. Not to get too clinical or too grotesque on you, but he'd had his colon removed at the end of September. And that went so well that it was no more complicated than an appendectomy. But what followed was a series of infections, like storms in the monsoon season. One arriving, blossoming, inundating him, my dad shaking it off and cheerfully bouncing back. And then within days, another one coming in to flatten him once again. Pneumonia. Three or four times, a lost count. Kidney failure, liver failure. The liver failure got better, remarkably enough. Dialysis, feeding tubes, drainage taps, drainage tubes, breathing tubes. Couldn't talk through that. Then he got strong enough and they could put a cap on the breathing tube and one day he scared the crap out of a friend of his who didn't know, who came in and gave him the customary, how you doing, Ted? Only to jump out of his shoes when my father suddenly and gleefully answered him in a strong, full voice, surprisingly well. Sometimes dad swelled up and looked like he was as puffy as a prize fighter who'd had a really bad night. Sometimes he'd get dialysis that was so effective or an antibiotic so specific that he would look like he did 25 years ago. Three weeks ago, they had found something extraordinary. A nurse noticed what seemed like a minor infection just below the surface of the skin, a kind of super pimple, if you will. It was actually the front edge of a series of abscesses, which would be drained and would produce, all told, about six liters of infected stuff. Six liters. You know how much that is? You know what that looks like? You don't want to know. But you do want to know it's been found because it means the man hasn't been weak all this time. He's been incredibly, inhumanly strong. The abscesses were like swimming pools for these infections. The strongest one would emerge. Then my dad, with the help of the antibiotics, would kill it off. Then the antibiotics would be discontinued. And the next infection would pop out and challenge him. As he pointed out, you know, just like the organized crime families. Then last week they found another abscess of sorts in the chest. So they needed to put drains in there too. This was Friday morning. His surgical team came in to see him. He did his nonverbal caricature of their chief. They all laughed like hell. They numbed him up, snip, snip, plug, plug, and this infection starts draining and they leave him alone for a while. Then in the afternoon they changed a few of the plugs the IVs attached to, and the respiratory therapist had been in checking the ventilator and his tubes because there was a leak somewhere. And to improve his dialysis, they changed his dialysis port. And then in the evening, they needed a CAT scan of his chest to make sure those drains were in the right place. And they had to change a dressing on some bad skin. And every hour, of course, the nurse had to come in and draw blood to check how well he was getting oxygen. And then at night, it was time for dialysis using the new dialysis port. And that's when I showed up after this show. My father was a little annoyed the way he often gets in there, annoyed about all the activity. That day it was like being Sisyphus with that boulder, only at the top of the hill, when he loses the boulder, it doesn't just roll back downhill, it rolls over him first. He's brave about pain, provided you warn him in advance, and provided the sheer volume of the activity during the day doesn't terrify him. As in terrorism, it is not just when terror happens, it's terror that it might happen. So he's annoyed, but in a good mood Friday night, and I, as I usually do, I sit down to read to him. Thurber. I've been reading a lot of James Thurber short stories lately. He's insisted I should do it on the show. We'll see about that. But a few pages in, the x-ray technician shows up. They have to take one more picture of him to see if those new drains in his chest are working. And I have to leave his room for at most three minutes. And I come back in, and my father is thrashing his head back and forth. You can't hear him, he can't speak at the moment, but you become a lip reader in those circumstances and this one word he keeps repeating is not tough to discern. Help. He's mouthing the word help over and over and over again. And I get his attention and he is in full panic. Maybe the x-ray tech hurt his, dad, his back or touched my dad's new chest drains. More likely he did nothing very much at all. But it was just too much for my father. Stop this, he mouths. Stop, stop, stop. And I say to him, I know for a fact they're not doing anything more to you tonight. And he looks at me and he starts thrashing his head again. Help, help, help. I get his attention once more. I ask him, do you want me to stop all of this? And he looks at me and mouths, yes. And I ask him, you understand what happens then? And he looks at me and again, mouths, yes. And I ask him, 
you realize you are not terminally ill right now. If we do stop all of this, it might not be quick. And he mouths, stop this. And I say try to joke him out of it or through it. And trust me, Gallo's humor is your best defense in this situation. What, you want me to smother you with a pillow? And he mouths, yes, kill me. I told my dad that obviously I would not do that, but I would go and talk to the doctors. When I came back, I told him they would really be put out by this because he wasn't sick enough, and all the indications were he could still fight off what remained of those infections. And he went back to thrashing his head and mouthing help because clearly I was not giving him the sense of relief, relief from the paradoxical truth that people desperately trying to save your life sometimes manage only or also to torture you. Of course, I actually was trying to get him that sense of relief. When I went to see the surgical intensive care unit resident, I told him my dad had hit his wall, that he couldn't take any other work, that it was now terrifying torture, that he needed it to stop. But I said, look, I'm his health proxy. We had conversations about end of life care. We've had them in here. We've had them when he was home and well. I am not operating in the dark here. I said, I think he really wants the one word he keeps mouthing. He wants help. Is there any medical reason not to, I don't know, give him some sedation, some sort of mental vacation from being the patient? The resident thought that was a damn good idea and said it would also help his breathing, which the respiratory therapist had noticed wasn't quite right that night. So when I came in and gave my father the song and dance about how put out the doctors were, really I was just stalling. I started to read to him again and he was still thrashing his head from side to side in utter frustration. And then he started to calm down and enjoy the story. And as he began to close his eyes and rest, the nurse slipped in and injected a sedative into one of his IVs. And as I left the hospital that night, the full impact of these last six months washed over me. What I had done, conferring with the resident in ICU, the conversation about my father's panicky, not in complete control of his faculties demand that all treatment now stop, about the options and the consequences and the compromise, the sedation, the help, for a brave man who just needed a break. That conversation, that one, was what these ghouls who are walking into Blair House tomorrow morning decided to call death panels. Your right to have that conversation with a doctor, not the government, but a doctor, and your right to have insurance pay for his expertise on what your options are when dad says, kill me, or what your options are when dad is in a coma and can't tell you a damn thing or what your options are when everybody is healthy and happy and coherent and you're just planning ahead. Your right to have the guidance and the reassurance of a professional who can lay that all out for you. That's a quote, death panel, unquote. That right now is the legacy of the protests of these subhumans who get paid by the insurance companies, who say these things for their own political gain, or like that one fiend, for money, for money. Betsy McCoy told people that this conversation about life and death and relief and release, and also about, no, keep treating him no matter what happens until the nation runs out of medicine. She told people that's a death panel, and she did that for money. It's a life panel, a life panel. It can save the pain of the patient and the family. It is the difference between you guessing what happens next and you being informed about what probably will. And that's the difference between you sleeping at night or second guessing and third guessing and 30th guessing yourself. And it can also be the place where the family says, we want you to keep them alive no matter what. We believe in miracles. And the doctor says, yes. Nobody gets to say no except the patient and the family. It's a life panel and damn those who call it otherwise to hell. And that brings up the other point of all this. They've rolled my father under every piece of machinery in there except an atom splitter. They've pumped him full of every drug and remedy and he's got Medicare and some supplemental insurance and my out-of-pocket medical bills over the last six months have been greater than my dad's have. And why in the hell should that not be true of everybody in every hospital, in every sick room, in every clinic in this country. What is this country for if not to take care of its people? Because whatever I've been through these last six months and whatever my dad's been through, not once were our fears or our decisions amplified by the further horror of wondering, how in the hell would we pay for this? What about families having these conversations tonight about kids 
or about uninsured adults, or what about the guy out there whose father is 50 and he's mouthing the word help, and the guy knows what his father doesn't know, that the insurance company has just declared the illness the father has is a pre-existing condition, and he has no more insurance. And when that son goes out to talk to that doctor about what to do next, even if there is a chance of recovery, that son can't afford to pay for it. That is the goddamned death panel, Sarah Palin. Since Friday night, my father has been comfortable. He's been breathing well, and there's been no sign of stress or discomfort. He has also not awakened. His white blood cell count, the indicator of infection, is now at about four or five times normal. Doubtlessly, in removing that much infection from him, some of it got loose into his bloodstream or it came in from another source. He's not being sedated anymore, but he only has the strength to fight off the infections or wake up, not both. We're hoping he does the first, then the latter. We are prepared for the probability that he will do neither. His team and I had another life discussion, life panel discussion, not six hours ago. And thank God I had those conversations with my father. Thank God I got his instructions about when to use my judgment and when to stick exclusively with his, when, if he's capable of recovery, to let them use everything they have, and when to make sure they're not just keeping him alive with no hope, when to listen to the instruction, help first, and then the one about stop later. So considering that if he does not recover, you will not see me here for a while, I have some requests. First of you, please have this conversation with your loved ones. Don't wait. Do it now. It's tough. It acknowledges death. And it also narrows the gray area you or they will face from infinity to about a foot wide. It is my greatest comfort right now, and I want it to be yours. And to the politicians who go into Blair House tomorrow for that summit, I have some requests as well. And leave your egos at the door. I want, I demand, that you give everybody in this country a chance at the care my father has gotten. And I demand that you enact this most generous and most kind aspect of the reform proposed, the right to build the damned insurance company for the conversation about what to do when the time comes, the life panel. And I want all of you to think of somebody lying in a hospital bed tonight who needed that care and needed that conversation and imagine that is your father or mother or son or daughter or wife or husband or partner. And if you cannot do that, if you cannot put aside the meaninglessness of your political careers for this, my request to you then is that you not come back out of that meeting, for you would not be worthy of being with the real people of this country who suffer and who suffer again because you have acted on behalf of the corporations and not the people. If you cannot do this, go into that room and stay there and we will get new ones to replace your worthless roles in the life of our country. My father cannot speak for himself. He appointed me to do so for him. I haven't the slightest doubt he wants me to say this tonight, right now. He mouthed these words to me, and I will now give them such voice as I have to you going into that summit tomorrow. Help, help, help. Help. Good night, man. Good luck.